Hello and Namaste. I'm Dr. Ritu Bashal, Assistant Professor in the Department of Biochemistry. I welcome you all to the yet another session of Recall CEE 2077. Before I start, I request you to follow the standard textbooks in biochemistry. Let's start with the questions. The first question is, which of the following is an analog of hypoxanthine? And the options provided are allopurinol, ribose sugar, xanthine oxidase, and ornithine. So in this uh, question, it is asked about the analog of hypoxanthine. We need to know which one is analog of hypoxanthine. So we need to know in which pathway the hypoxanthine comes. So let's discuss that pathway. This is the purine degradation pathway. So here we can see the ionosine is converted into hypoxanthine. The hypoxanthine is then converted into xanthine. And finally, it is converted into uric acid. In this pathway, the enzyme involved is xanthine oxidase. So here we can see xanthine oxidase in both the steps. One important pharmacological association in this step is this xanthine oxidase is inhibited by allopurinol. And this allopurinol is the structural isomer of hypoxanthine. So allopurinol is the analog of hypoxanthine. So allopurinol is the right answer. The other options provided in this question is ribose sugar. So let's see what is the ribose sugar. Ribose sugar is the pentose sugar that is obtained from HM Pichant. And if this ribose sugar combines with a base, it becomes a nucleoside. And if this ribose sugar combines with base and phosphate, it becomes a nucleotide. So that is a ribose sugar, which is not the correct answer. Next option is uh, given is the ornithine. The ornithine is one of the compon component in the urea cycle. Uh, the ornithine combines with carbamol phosphate to give citrulline. So ornithine is nowhere near hypoxanthine, so it is not the right answer. So the right answer in the question, the analog to hypoxanthine is allopurinol. Moving on to the next question. The next question is, what is the non-protein part of rhodopsin? And the options given are retinol, retinol, carotene and repsin. So in this, we need to know where this rhodopsin comes in. So let's look into the rhodopsin retinal visual cycle. So this is the rhodopsin retinal visual cycle. In this, we can see the vitamin A, which is the all trans retinol, gets converted into 11 cells retinol which then gets converted into 11 cells retinal and it combines with scotopsin to form the rhodopsin. So in this we can see the scotopsin combines with 11 cells retinal to give rhodopsin. So the, rhodops the scotopsin is the protein part of rhodopsin and the non-protein part of rhodopsin is the retinal. So in the options provided the retinal is the right answer. The retinol is the vitamin A form, carotene is the precursor for vitamin and repsin is one of the antibiotic which are all incorrect and the right answer is retinal. Moving on to the third question, which one of the following is used as the templates for PCR? The options given are double stranded DNA, single stranded DNA, RNA and protein. The question says which of the following is used as templates for the PCR? So we need to know what is the template for PCR. This is a little confusing question. So, uh, before moving on to the actual answer, let's see what, what is a PCR. In PCR, there are multiple of steps. The first step is the denaturation. So there is first step is the denaturation in which double-stranded DNA is separated by increasing the temperature. So the temperature is increased up to 95 degrees centigrade. Then because of the increased temperature, the strands get separated and become single strands. And then in this single strands, the primer is added. They bind to their specific site. For the binding of the primer, the temperature is decreased to 50 to 65 degrees centigrade. After that, the temperature is increased to around 72 degrees centigrade. At this point, the primer, in the presence of all other uh, components like uh, deoxy nucleotides, DNA polymerase, TAC polymerase, the buffers, the uh, divalent compounds that we need, in the presence of all these, the strand will start to elongate. So this is the elongation step. So overall, the steps are denaturation, annealing, and elongation. So this is the overall steps in the PCR. Now the question says the template that is required for a DNA. This is the thing to understand that even a single strand of DNA is more than enough for the PCR to continue. 
it's not mandatory to have two strands of DNA. So a single strand of DNA that is the template, template is the single strand of DNA. So that is more than enough for a PCR to continue. If we have the, sorry, if we have this template DNA, then it will make its complementary DNA strand, then the process will continue. Now what will happen if the strand provided is of RNA virus? We know the viral RNA, they are uh, single stranded. And now when it is a single stranded, in the presence of primer and in the presence of reverse transcriptase, it will make a complementary DNA. When we have a complementary DNA, that is the single template strand, then that can be used to continue the PCR process. So in this uh, question, the right answer would be the uh, single stranded DNA. Moving on to the fourth question, what is the earliest manifestation seen in carnitine defect? So it is saying that there is a carnitine defect and if there is such defect, what would be the earliest manifestation? And the answers, options provided to you are hypoketotic hypoglycemia, liver disease, cardiomyopathy and skeletal myopathy. So earliest manifestation in carnitine defect. Now let's see where is it, where the carnitine uh, compound comes in. Uh, let's look into this figure. Now let's see where the carnitine uh, comes in. In the long chain fatty acid, it cannot directly enter inside the mitochondria for beta oxidation. First, it has to be converted into acyl-CoA form, which is done by acyl-CoA synthetase. Once it is converted into acyl-CoA form, it can, it can cross the outer mitochondrial membrane. Then, in the presence of carnitine, the acyl carnitine is formed. Now, after the acyl carnitine is formed, in the presence of carnitine acyl, uh, acyl carnitine translocase, the acyl carnitine can cross the inner mitochondrial membrane in the exchange of carnitine. So, carnitine, carnitine goes out and the acyl carnitine comes in, in, crosses the inner mitochondrial membrane. Now, this acyl carnitine is finally converted into the acyl CoA in the presence of carnitine palmitoyl transferase 2. So, here it is carnitine palmitoyl transferase 2 in the inner mitochondrial membrane and in the outer mitochondrial membrane there was carnitine palmitoyl transferase 1. There is one significance of that, we will talk about that in later slides. So, once the acyl carnitine is formed, it can undergo beta oxidation. Now, let's talk about what is the source of carnitine. The source of carnitine is, it, we can get it from diet, from the meat products, or it can be synthesized in our body from lysine and methionine in liver and kidney. So, these are the sources of carnitine. Now, the question has said that what happens if there is deficient of carnitine? Now, suppose there is no carnitine. So, the car if there is no carnitine, there is no formation of acyl carnitine. If there is no acyl carnitine, then there is no beta oxidation. And please remember, beta oxidation helps in the release of energy. When we are in starving state, the gluconeogenesis occurs, but for the first step of gluconeogenesis, it requires energy. And that energy is obtained from beta oxidation. So, if there is no carnitine, there is no beta oxidation, so there is no gluconeogenesis. So, the patient can become hypoglycemic. Another thing that can happen is, if there is no beta oxidation, there is no acetyl-CoA and there is no formation of ketone bodies. So, there will be decreased level of glucose and decreased level of ketone bodies. Initially, I said there was two important things to remember, that was CPT1 and CPT2. So, if the patient has genetic CPT1 deficiency, then it can affect the liver. But if the patient has genetic CPT2 deficiency, then it can affect cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle. But in our scenario, the question that was asked was the earliest manifestation in carnitine defect. So because of lack of beta oxidation, there will be less glucose level, less ketone bodies. So our right answer would be hypoketotic hypoglycemia. Moving on to the next question, accumulation of homogentisic acid is seen in and the options provided to you are uh, phenylketone urea, homocysteine urea, alkaptone urea and maple syrup urine disease. Now let's look into them one by one. The first one is phenylketone urea. In phenylketone urea, what happens is there is a deficiency of phenylalanine hydroxylase. When this enzyme is deficient, phenylalanine cannot be converted into tyrosine. So because of that, the phenylalanine will be accumulated and it can get converted into phenyl pyruvate, lactate, acetate and these will get accumulated. 
So, in the absence of phenylalanine hydroxylase, the patient can develop phenylketonuria. So, this is not the right answer. Next one is homocysteineuria. What happens in this is, the in the patient, there is deficient cystathione beta synthase. This enzyme is deficient because of which homocysteine cannot get converted into cystathionine. Because of the deficiency of cystathionine beta synthase, the homocysteine cannot get converted, converted into cystathionine and because of this, homocysteine will get accumulated leading to homocysteine urea. Next one was uh, alkaptone urea and in this what, ha what happens is there is a deficiency of homozentesic acid oxidase. So in absence of this enzyme what happens is the homozentesic acid cannot get converted further and it gets accumulated leading to the condition known as alkaptone urea and this is our right answer. And the last option that was given was maple syrup urine disease. What happens in this disease is deficiency of branched chain alpha keto acid dehydrogenase leads to accumulation of branched chain amino acid like leucine, isoleucine and valin and their corresponding alpha keto acids. So in summarization the question said the accumulation of homozentesic acid is seen in which of this condition and the right answer would be alkaptone urea. Moving on to the sixth question. The question says which one of the following is an hereditary amino acid metabolism defect? So it says hereditary amino acid metabolism defect. Out of all these options provided, we have already talked about branching amino acid urea, phenylketone urea and homocysteine urea and all of these are hereditary amino acid metabolism defect. The last option, uh, albinism, which we have not discussed is about the, let's see about this. It comes in the tyrosine catabolism. So first phenylalanine is converted into tyrosine, it is then converted into dopa and this dopa is converted into melanin in the presence of tyrosinase. So if the enzyme tyrosinase is absent, then the dopa cannot be converted into melanin. Okay? And in this situation, the patient can develop albinism. Okay, moving on to question number 7. Uh, it says which of the vitamin is toxic to liver? In this, we need to know which vitamin is toxic to liver. The options provided are vitamin B1, vitamin B2, B3 and vitamin D. Out of these options, vitamin B2 and B1 are never toxic. No toxicity has been reported regarding these vitamins, vitamin B1 and B2. The remaining options are vitamin B3 and vitamin D. So, let's see. Vitamin B3 is a niacin. Niacin is not toxic when obtained from food. Daily amounts over 2000 mg can decrease insulin sensitivity and can cause liver toxicity. So here we can see that if we take daily to more than 2000 mg of uh, niacin, then it can cause decreased insulin sensitivity along with liver toxicity. So this is our right answer. Along with this, few more information are there. Niacin in the form of nicotinic acid in amounts as low as 35 mg can cause niacin flush. It can dilate the capillaries causing brief tingling and flushing of the skin. So, vitam vitamin B3 that is niacin can cause liver toxicity. And regarding vitamin D, uh, and the toxicity is very very rare and even if the toxicity occurs, the symptom the patient will present is uh, hypercalcemia, the increased level of calcium in the circulation and when the calcium level is increased, it can get deposited in the different sites like it can cause bone pain or it can lead to the formation of renal stones. So, vitamin D is not the right answer in this case. Apart from the vitamins that have been provided in the option, there are three other vitamins which can show toxicity. The first one is vitamin B6 pyridoxine. Uh, no toxicity has been reported from food or below 200 mg per day. But if we exceed 200 mg, then that can cause toxicity. Next vitamin is vitamin A. Toxicity is possible with supplemental forms of vitamin A and with high intakes from food. So if you take vitamin A containing food in very large amount, it can cause toxicity. And the last vitamin is vitamin E. Vitamin E is non-toxic at less than uh, 66 times the RDA. So, the question that we had was, which of the vitamin is toxic to liver? So, the right answer would be vitamin B3. Moving on to the last question. The question says, true about proofreading of DNA is, 
and the options provided to you are 5 prime to 3 prime exonuclease activity 3 prime to 5 prime exonuclease activity 5 prime to 3 prime endonuclease activity 3 prime to 5 prime endonuclease activity now there are certain things we need to understand in this question before jumping to the right answer let's look into the content so let's talk about dna chain elongation so in this what is important to know is we always read the strand from 3 prime to 5 prime so the template strand is always read from 3 prime to 5 prime direction and when we make the strand new strand then it is synthesized from 5 prime to 3 prime direction so notice that it is read from 3 prime to 5 prime and the new strand is made in the anti parallel direction and uh, that is from 5 prime to 3 prime so this is the direction of synthesizing the new 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 strands so this is the direction of growth here we can see that from 5 prime to 3 prime this is the direction and it is elongating the chain in this portion there are certain things that we need to understand there are certain terms like one is polymerase so what is polymerase it means to extend the chain that is the polymerase next is what is exonuclease so exonuclease means the enzyme that removes the nucleotide from the end of the strand okay so it can be the from the 5 prime end or the 3 prime end but not from the middle of the strand and the term endonuclease means the enzyme that can remove the nucleotide from between between the strand now if this is clear let's move on let's look into this so this is our dna template strand it is from 3 prime to 5 prime direction and the new strands are synthesized from 5 prime to 3 prime direction so here the enzyme is the dna polymerase 3 now what does this dna polymerase 3 can do is it can extend the strand from 5 prime to 3 prime direction so it will go on adding a new nucleotide but in doing so at times there might be some mistake in doing that like in this figure here we can see that in adenine instead of attaching thymine it is attaching cytosine so the polymerase can identify this mistake it can remove this nucleotide and it can attach a new nucleotide so in doing so can you tell me in which direction the dna polymerase will remove this new this wrong nucleotide will it remove it from 5 prime direction or will it remove it from 3 prime direction so obviously it cannot go from this direction to remove this wrong nucleotide it has to go from 3 prime direction to 5 prime direction okay and so that activity is known as the proofreading activity of polymerase so the polymerase when there is a wrong nucleotide it will remove that wrong nucleotide from the 3 prime to 5 prime direction and it will attach the new nucleotide okay that is from 5 prime to 3 prime direction thus the dna polymerase has 5 prime to 3 prime polymerase activity and 3 prime to 5 prime exonuclease activity meaning that it is removing the wrong nucleotide from the end of the strand and not from the between and from which direction it is moving from 3 prime direction to 5 prime direction thus the question said that true about proofreading of dna so this is the proofreading activity so true about this proofreading activity is 3 prime to 5 prime exonuclease activity okay so this will be the right answer not 5 prime to 3 prime exonuclease it is exonuclease but not from this direction not from 5 prime to 3 prime direction and the other two options given were endonuclease it is not removing the nucleotide that that is in middle of the chain but it is removing the nucleotide that is at the end okay so it is 3 prime to 5 prime exonuclease activity so in this one last thing I want you to think about is what are the different roles of DNA polymerase 1 so I want you to go through this and find out the answers thank you everyone and I wish you all the luck for your exams